Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time to join in a moment of worship. And uh, I've been thinking about how this works, how this video moment uh, works. And what I'm going to start doing is putting the reading of the scripture into the sermon itself. And also, uh, I'm working on improving the lighting in here. It's okay, but it could be better. So uh, we're going to continue to improve as we go, since it has become clear that uh, this video, this approach to inviting people to turn to Jesus and follow Jesus is going to be something we're going to be doing for a while. Nelson Mandela served 27 years in prison, locked up in a place called Rikers Island for the crime of trying to overthrow apartheid, which was a system of state-sponsored oppression and terrorism of indigenous peoples that had lasted, at that point, 40 years in South Africa. When Nelson strode out of the uh, jail cell and into the sunlight, he was also in a, a very intense other form of light, in addition to the sunlight. He was in the spotlight. He was in the spotlight of national and international attention. For no one knew what to expect of him. Everyone knew what he had gone into prison as. He had gone into prison as a young man, a boxer, an activist, activist, someone with great potential as a leader. Everyone knew he would play a critical role in what was going to happen next in South Africa. What would he be, right? What, what would 27 years in jail do to a person? They hadn't heard from him the entire time. Think about that. What would 27 years in jail do to someone? What he wrote of that moment is, as I walked out of the door toward my freedom, I knew that if I did not leave all the anger, all of the anger, hatred, and bitterness behind, that I would still be in prison. He did this as an act rooted in his Christian faith. Forgive as you have been forgiven. The prayer that we pray every Sunday, that many of us pray far more often than that, the Lord's Prayer, right? That, that's part of the, the prayers that had sustained Nelson Mandela in his many years in prison. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so when he was elected the president of South Africa, the person who had been his jailer was there. Was there at the inauguration. He was there. He was in the front row. He had a seat of honor. Imagine what that would have meant to the nation. And imagine what that would take. What type of character. What type of, not just like, I mean, forgiveness that was a, a complete commitment to this is how I'm going to forgive. This is forgiveness on a level that mattered, right? Deep, just deeply mattered to Nelson Mandela, mattered to the nation. It gave him the standing to be able to lead the nation, neither falling into the temptation of never-ending trials, nor yielding to the calls to let the past be the past, and let's just move on and let the problems of the past lapse into an amnesia that attempts to gloss over what had happened. He was able to do what he did, lead the nation of South Africa through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, through a time of telling the truth about itself, because he had forgiven himself, and he was able to invite people to follow the path that he had already walked. Isn't that leadership at its most basic? Follow me. And Nelson Mandela could say that, and people did. Forgiveness and reconciliation transforms tragedies into miracles. That's what we see in Nelson Mandela's life. When we forgive, when we take the time to reconcile, to rebuild the relationships that have been fractured, it may not change an entire nation's future like it did for Nelson Mandela, but it can change our world. It, cha it can change our community and our family, and it does change our future. To embrace the practice of forgiveness thus becomes essential to following Jesus. 
to showing people that there is a kingdom to come that is rooted in peace. It is a way that we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5. We are ambassadors, we are diplomats of Jesus. And if you think about the nature of being a diplomat, is to live in a community, to represent another community, right? Representing another community. A diplomat, if you're a diplomat uh, from America to Italy, you live in Italy, you are sent from America to represent American interests in Italy. As followers of the Prince of Peace, we are diplomats into this world. We are diplomats of the kingdom, the kingdom of God sent into this world a world that is addicted to disagreements and grudges, violence to winners and losers. And we are sent to, to represent the politics, the approach of, of Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God. We are sent in this world that wants to play the devil's game, to hold on to grudges, to refuse and to forgive. It is of the devil, it is evil. And we are sent into this world that's addicted to it, to say, but we forgive. That's what it means. We, we follow Jesus. We're diplomats of forgiveness. These last weeks, we've been looking at the details of how this works. What do we do to forgive? Because right? forgiveness is not about what we feel. It's about what we do. It's about the choices that we make. We have been following the advice of Adam Hamilton's uh, teaching on this. He writes a book called Forgiveness, which is easy to remember. I highly recommend it to you if you want to continue to think through what this looks like. And the way that we have been thinking about forgiving sin is the idea of putting down the burdens that when someone sins against us, the burdens that those sins place on us. Right? When someone doesn't return my phone call, that puts a burden on my life. I now have to do something uh, to try to deal with that business. Right? If, if I expected that someone's going to get back to me and they don't, right, that they have placed a burden on me. And we talked about the, the, initially about how these small burdens, the things uh, that are small things that people do against us, uh, cut, cut us off in line, uh, just are rude, are, are just the small things in life. How these small burdens, we, if we hold on to them, they will, bur they will become quite the burden to carry, but we can put them down. We put these small rocks down by remembering that we're not perfect either, by assuming the best the, about the intentions of the other person, and then praying for the other person. Right. So we do that. When the, then last week we talked about the larger burdens. When it comes to someone that sins against us, and it is something that's large enough that could damage or end a relationship. We went from talking about small rocks and small stones to something larger, something like of significance, something that if you tried to carry this ar around, it would be damaging, right? If someone sins against you and it is a big deal, like how do we handle that? To put that down, the way that we put that burden down and forgive, is we follow Jesus' very specific guidance. In Matthew 5, he says, if we have offended someone, we go to that person and we ask, do I owe you an apology? What can I do to make it right? And if we are the person who, have, who has been offended, we go to the person and we say, I was hurt. Can we work this out? And if that doesn't work, you go and you get a mutually agreeable person to help work through it. And then if you have to, you bring it to the church. You do what you need to, to be able to work this out. And that, then we as a community, as fellow Christians, we're the people who can say to folks, I am praying for both of you. I love you both, and I'm praying that you work it out. I look forward to the two of you. Can I help the two of you work it out, right? Because we don't want to reinforce. We don't want to build walls. We don't want to create gossip and create barriers. We don't want to condone by not saying anything and being taken as just approving. No, we, we need to be part of a people that say, you, the two of you, you, you need to work this out. We need to do what we can. So we've talked about the small rocks. We've talked about the, the stones that are of weight that can damage a relationship. What about the boulders? What about the weights that are so heavy 
that they don't just damage a relationship, but they can change a person's entire life, like being imprisoned for 27 years. Nelson Mandela was imprisoned, a great burden, a great sin, a boulder placed on his life. For 27 years, he did not see his wife, his family, his community, right? That's quite the burden. Or another boulder that you could think of that we know a different, from a different story we know of. Imagine being sold to slavers by your brother, by your brothers, plural. Right? This is the story of Joseph. Joseph, uh, his story has been told many times, animated, musicals, right? It's always a striking story. And if you want to read more of this story, as I'll give you a brief overview right now, but more of his story, all of it, is found in Genesis 37 through 50. Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And those 12, each of them is a father of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it would be easy, easy to put them on a pedestal, but they're a family, just like any other family, and they have their issues, their tensions, their challenges. And their father, Jacob, played favorites, and it caused problems, right? He showed blatant favoritism to one of his youngest sons, Joseph. One sign of this favoritism was that he gave his youngest son a coat. Now, Technicolor Dreamcoat is what the musical calls it, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. But that's not what's actually in, in, in Hebrew. Uh, there's no word in Hebrew for, well, there probably is a modern Hebrew word for Technicolor, but there wasn't one in ancient times. And, but in ancient times, to be given an extra coat, let's say I have extra sets of clothing was a sign of wealth because you had to create clothing by hand and you had to sew it by hand you had to weave it by hand it was quite the endeavor to have a special coat would have been extravagant the way this coat is described is it's described with the same words that are used to describe a bride's uh, outfit on her wedding day the finery, uh, the most finery that can, fine garment that can be made. And so when the older brothers are out working in the field, tending to the flock, doing the work of the family, and young Joseph saunters up, obviously not dressed for work, wearing this coat, talking about dreams of all his brothers bowing before him, like, let's remember, he's one of the youngest of the brothers, and so that means those 12 brothers older than him, some of them are old enough that they're going to be starting their own families soon, if they haven't already. Like, they're going to be building their own flocks. Like, they, they're at the point where... They're ready, they, they're ready to teach Joseph how to do the family business, not do it for him. And so he saunters up, ready to, to be admired. He wants to brag, and it doesn't go well. The older brothers, in a fit of rage and jealousy or of whatever, I, I, we don't really know, they sell him to some people passing by who... Uh, are slavers. They, they buy Joseph and they take him to Egypt and the story unfolds and he is forgotten and then in a twist he comes to the attention of Pharaoh. He becomes a servant of Pharaoh. He uh, proves his worth. He becomes uh, the person who leads, uh, the organizes, the, the kingdom of, of Egypt so, such that it, it gathers the crop during the seven good years and then during the seven years of drought that follow uh, he, is a, he is the one who oversees the distribution of the food and so it is at this moment when Joseph's family all of his brothers are there looking for food they come to Egypt and, and they, they are looking for food and, and Joseph has this opportunity in which he could uh, get back at them but he doesn't and he forgives them and he has forgiven them, and then he's able to forgive them in person uh, and, and tell them that they've been forgiven all along. And he, uh, that feels like the end of the story, right? He forgives them in person, and they move to Egypt. It is at the end, in Genesis 50, that the story really kind of culminates. That's the point. This is the point I want to read to us today. After their father dies, this is what happens. 
Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us? Right? Hear that? They're worried that their brother still hasn't really forgiven them. Kind of forgiven them, but they're worried there's a grudge there. A right? grudge is just, the definition of a grudge is not forgiving, holding on to the getting back at somebody. So, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approach Joseph saying, your father, notice it's not our father, it's your father, is a claim, making sure <laughs> your daddy told us to tell you, right? your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fall down, fell down before him and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. How many years did it take for Joseph to be able to say that? To be able to go from angry and hurt. To be able to get to the point where he didn't wake up angry. To be able to get up and not dwell on what had happened. To be able to work with the situation he was in. And one day to be able to forgive. So that when his brothers showed up, he didn't hurt them did not get revenge. And then years after that, to further be able to say that what had happened had been redeemed, that he would now use it for good, that it had been used for good. How long did it take Nelson Mandela to be able to walk out of that prison cell and see that he had to forgive or else he would still be locked up in his own anger? And then to be able to see how those 27 years had prepared him to lead a nation that had also suffered in those same 27 years. The brothers of Joseph had a hard time believing that such a tragedy could be redeemed, that their sin could be in the end used for good, but in the end it had been. Joseph could see it and name it, and then they could see it and name it as well. It is possible. I pray that no one here ever has to. I know that I don't want to be in such a position, but it can be done by the grace of God. The way it is done, thus, is one day at a time. To forgive, to, to put down the burden that has been placed on us, it is something that we do one day at a time. Every time that we don't hurt someone back when we could, it's like chipping off a bit of the stone, chipping off the, a bit of the boulder that bears down on us. Every day that we pray for God's blessing on the person who hurt us is chipping off of a, a bit of that stone. Every moment that we find joy and we don't let that rock, that burden determine our lives is another chip off that stone. And done day after day after day, what begins as a boulder over time becomes a lot less overwhelming. It becomes less large. It becomes less something that is crushing and is more something to carry until finally there is no burden at all, right? It takes time. Jo Joseph was not ready to forgive his brothers after a few months or even a few years. He had to have time. Forgiveness of what is horrible, it takes time and it takes different, it takes distance. It probably took him having a few moments of looking back on his, his life in the new light of new experiences. For example, Joseph had two sons. And I wonder, at what point did he show favor, at what point did he do what his dad did and show favor to one of his sons? Watch what happened because of it and have a moment of ah. That, that's a little bit more, understanding a bit more about what had happened in his past. It's not to say that it makes what happened right. It means that over time we understand the nuances and the details of why it happened the way it did. Rome was not built in a day. Forgiveness takes time. But in taking the time, choosing again and again, 
That is what we do. Forgiveness is about not is never about what we feel. Forgiveness is about, not about our feelings. It is about our choices. It's about what we choose to do. Choosing to pray for the other person. Choosing not to hurt them back. Choosing to find joy and not be determined by what happened in the past. And there comes a point when that burden has lessened so that it might even become something that drives us into our future. An example of this, uh, I give this example because it is something that is widely known. There are other examples I could give from people I know, but that is, it is their story to tell. And so this, this is a story that's a public story I can tell about this. Right? Patrick Stewart is a widely known public figure, and I first knew him as Captain Picard on the Star Tri Starship Enterprise, and then as the wise Professor Xavier on, in the X-Men movies. Right? He has... Um, been a great actor of this age, and he has spoken very publicly about his childhood, that it was scarred by domestic violence, that his father hurt his mother often. To hear him speak of it is hard to hear. And because he could not, his hel he, because he could not help his mother then, he works to stop vi domestic violence now. He supports safe houses in Britain where women can go and be truly safe. This is something he's done for his adult life. And then in the last couple years, uh, he shared in a, an interview he had, he um, found his father's journals. His father had been a soldier in World War I in the British Expeditionary Force that had gone to France. And he'd been di his father had been diagnosed uh, with shell shock. And the way shell shock was treated back then in the middle of the 20th century was, well, get back to it, man up, right? Now we understand that that is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And untreated, it can cause amazing harm to the person and amazing harm to the person's family as they are unable to, to control parts of their emotional life, right? And so he understands more now. And so, in the same way that he could not help his mom then, so he helps pe victims of domestic violence now, he could not help his father then. But now he works to help uh, make treatment available for British soldiers who have been impacted by PTSD. And, and this is something that just happened, with the thing with his dad. Like, that's something he realized when he was in his 70s. Like, Patrick Stewart's 80 years old now. Forgiveness of some things is a lifelong journey, right? Taking what had happened and not being dominated, forget by it, forgiving it day by day, and one day being able to turn and being able to take those, those wounds that have become scars, that, that burden that we've chipped off enough of that uh, stone so it does not bear down on us in quite the way, so that we, we use that to help us, we use that knowledge and experience to help us to be able to serve others. It, it is a lifetime of, of a journey to do this. Forgiveness itself is a way of life. It, it, it draws the poison out of the past. It allows us to stop being victims. It allows us to build a life that is not defined by one horrible event. And maybe even it allows us to serve those who are still struggling. I need to add two caveats to this. First, when we forgive someone, maybe that's a relationship that can be rebuilt Maybe not. The person who has sinned against us, there has to be repentance. There has to be change. There has to be taking of responsibility. People who, who will never take responsibility that their actions have hurt people, well, there's a term for those type of folks. We call them manipulators. And, and you can't have a healthy relationship with someone who's manipulative like that. And whatever the relationship was, whatever the normal thing was, normal is what led to the harm that was caused. And so you can't ever go back to normal. You have to get, you have to, as, as a relationship, you and the other person, you have to work out a new normal that takes into account what happened and what needs to change because of it. It takes time. And, and I will say that I am not aware of many instances where one particular form of, of sin, domestic violence, I don't know if those relationships are ever healed this side of heaven. Um, that's just, that's too hard, right? No, no man should ever hit his wife. It, it, never, ever, right? Though those, ever. 
Um, second, there are consequences when someone is hurt badly. To forgive someone is not to deny that there are monetary, professional, relational, and legal consequences. Nothing that I've said today should be interpreted as a reason not to tell the authorities, tell the police about a crime that has been committed. Forgiveness never glosses over that there has been a real sin, a real evil that has occurred. All right. Then, once the truth has been told about it, we can move on to the healing of both the person and the, pers the person who hurt and the person who has caused the pain over time, forgiveness and, and, and reconciliation, but it, we never can gloss over the consequences of those actions. My friends, we are called to forgive as we have first been forgiven. This comes up often in what Jesus teaches and what he practices and what he teaches us to pray. And we struggle because we don't want to. Sometimes it is more comfortable just to be able to blame people. Sometimes we don't want to do the hard work of forgiveness. We'd rather not choose. Sometimes we are afraid that we would be somehow condoning or setting ourselves up to be hurt again. Whatever the reason is that we resist forgiveness, I must tell you, to not forgive is to deny Jesus who first forgave us. To, to not forgive is to hold a grudge. To not forgive is to play the devil's game. It is to choose to turn our backs on where we are called to go. We are called to the kingdom of God, the kingdom built on forgiveness. And the way that we get there is through forgiveness. I pray that each of us can practice forgiving and can help each other to do so, such that we, as a community and as individuals, are taking part in the healing of individual lives, in individual churches, and of great service to our, our community itself. By the grace of God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you forgave on the cross those who had nailed you there while you were still bleeding. We dare not ask for either such a burden, nor hope that we could respond with such love so quickly. And so we pray that you would send your spirit upon us that we would be able to start to forgive. And once started along this journey, we would be able to continue to forgive day by day, one choice at a time. That like your servant Joseph, we would be able to be peacemakers in our families, in our communities, and in this world. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.